Knowledge for Men, episode 102. Welcome to knowledgeformen.com, where you're going to grow into the man you want to be. Your life will never be the same again. I can guarantee it. Hey guys, one of the questions I've been getting a lot lately is, can you put together a list of the best books and success quotes from all of your guests and combine that into one guide? And so I've actually just done that. It's called the top 30 books and success quotes every man must live by. So out of all of the podcast episodes I've done, over 60, I finally put together this guide. And you can download it for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com. All right, guys, I'm here with Russ Whitney, family man, civic leader, self-made millionaire, philanthropist, and best-selling author. Russ, happy to have you on the show here. Well, it's uh, great to be here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. A total men's show. It's, uh, that's amazing. I don't know that I've ever done one of those. <laughs> First time for everything. And, you know, growing, thriving community here at Knowledge for Men. I'm glad to have you be a part of this show. And now we start off each show with a favorite success quote of a guest or a saying. So what do you got for us? And if you can explain why as well. Well, I'll um, start it off, off because it- Listeners may be not knowing what inner voice is all about, so I'll, I'll go from my warrior years, what I call my warrior years, from 20 to 40 years old. My Probably one of my best famous quotes that I live by was a Proverbs 23, 7 out of the Bible, which says, as a man or as a person thinketh in their heart, so are they, which means whatever we think about, whatever we're focusing on, whatever we're you know, ingraining ourselves in daily has to come about if we don't quit. Yeah, and that can go good or bad. You know, if we're focusing on the good, then you know, good things may arise. If we're focusing on the bad, and you know, we might see some bad things. <laughs> so you know, that kind of gives us an idea of who you are and some of the things you've been <laughs> through. But before we go into the work that you're doing now at the Inner Voice, I want to hear your story. I know you've uh, had quite the, you know, this wildly successful career in business, and with that comes the ups and downs, and and that's what I want to pull out. So. Go ahead and take the mic. Okay, well, good, because, you know, this really takes takes it to the message of inner voice. Usually I start with my grandparents back in the 1600s when they crossed Donner Pass. No, I'm just <laughs> Three-hour episode here, guys. <laughs> and then we go from there. <laughs> All right, well, no, no. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up in an abusive household, that, alcoholic parents, very abusive stepmother, uh, always got the message that I was never good enough. You know, you can't do walk the dog good enough. I couldn't get good enough grades no matter what it was. And I think lots of people have gone through some of that in their lives. Now, just just to uh, give you the the forward fast, that is, you know, I'm, I'm 58 years old now. So I'm starting way back, but 58 years young, I should say. Uh, and um, so uh, my dad died when I was 14 years old, and I ended up having to quit school at about 16. You know, I'd left the, the negative step. I went to live with some relatives. And I moved in with my sister. In, she lived in New York at that time. And so, so I had to get a job as a short order cook, a taxi cab driver, and I quit school. Then I got in trouble, a little trouble with the law. No, well, I guess it can't be a little trouble. It's either trouble or it's not. <laughs> so I got in trouble with the law. And my life was looking pretty drum at that time. Uh, then at 20 years old, which, by the way, I, I got arrested and I actually went to jail at 17 years old. Well, after that tragedy, let me put it that way, I moved to upstate New York, to Albany, New York. I met a lady, and three months later, we got married. So it seems like my, my life was moving fast. So, yeah, I only knew her for three months, and we were married for 29 years. And the only job I could get at that point in time, I got a job in a slaughterhouse. So if you go on Google, you can see it. It's called the Tobin Packing Company. But a factory, you know, six, five, six dollar an hour job. Which wasn't bad for me back then, you know, it was probably the best job I'd ever had. So now I'm married. Uh, Three months later, after we were married, I say after we were married, my wife got pregnant. (laughs) (laughs) So at 20, I was not a freewheeling bachelor, and, you know, I had a child on the way. And, you know what, Andrew, I started to get this voice in my head. And it was saying to me, you can do something better with your life. You can do something better with your life. Now, I wouldn't have called it my inner voice back then because I didn't have that terminology. And we'll talk about that, you know, as we get into the interview. But that was haunting me. You know, you could do something better with your life. Now, I grew up in a blue, like I say, blue-collar family. There was never any talk about owning your own business or becoming a millionaire or any of those kind of things. So that never even entered my mind So at that point. My idea of success was, you know, keeping this job, retiring in 25 years with the watch, a ride-on lawnmower, two cars, you know, and 
maybe learn how to play golf. But uh, anyway, one day at, at 20, somewhere in around that range, I, somebody put an entrepreneur magazine in front of me. Now, I, I don't know who went or what, I don't really recall. But there was no internet back then, obviously. So I start flipping through this magazine. As I get to the back, there's all these get rich quick ads. Now anybody, you know, old enough to remember that, or even now if you go to an entrepreneur magazine, they still got all the get rich quick ads there. Have you ever seen one of those, Andrew? Oh yeah. I mean those ads now are basically just online now. They're not I don't see them in magazines, but you know, infomercials, online ads. Yeah. So uh, I got excited as I saw these get rich quick ads because I'd never seen anything like that before. So, long story short, I start sending away for all these get rich quick ads. Mail order millions, how to stuff envelopes, make $300,000 a year for the rest of your life without getting out of bed. Uh, I, I almost wish that one would have worked. Uh, I, I sent for the Dura Clean, the Janet King franchises, you name it. And none of the stuff worked for me. And now, one day, I sent off for this book on real estate investing. And it was no magical answer. It was a $10 book. The book was called Financial Genius. Which you can probably still order it today. I think a lot of the principles in that book are still valid. But it was called How to Wake Up the Financial Genius Inside You by a guy named Mark Harrelson. And I sent for this book. And although the book didn't have any magical answers in it, it had a concept. And the concept talked about this. If, if you had the common sense to see that if you go to an area of town and look for properties that are in run-down, beat-up shape, and you had the common sense to see that if you paint them, you clean them, you jazz them up, that you could raise the value of those properties, I appeal wise. Then it also gave a mathematical formula. It said you could figure out whether these properties will make money or not before you ever buy them. Now, that formula in its, its you know, simplest form is add up the projected rents, add up the projected expenses, and if there's money left over, that's positive cash flow. Well, you know what? That made sense to me, and I thought, holy cow, I can do this. Within three weeks, on a rundown piece of property, I made $11,000. Now, that may not sound like a lot of money to a lot of folks, but you know, you go back 30 years ago, that was a year's pay for me. At $6 an hour on a 40-hour week, I was only making 240 bucks a week. So that was huge. But what I didn't do is I didn't go out and buy a new car or jewelry or vacation. I took all that money and I used it as a down payment on two more pieces of property. Then I learned how to take some home improvement loans and other, other strategies because it wasn't that I, I had bad credit. I didn't have any credit. You know, I was just getting started here at 20. So to make a long story short, within two years, at age 23, I was able to quit the job, financially independent. I wasn't rich, but I had enough money at six or seven properties. Each of them were generating somewhere between $150 and $350 a month in positive cash flow. So I had about $1,500 a month coming in net. So I used that money to make my mortgage payment, my car payment, to put food on the table, I have a little luxury money left over, but now I didn't have to go to the full-time job. You know, so anybody listening, that's always the first step, whether it's business, real estate, or whatever it is you decide to do as an entrepreneur. First step is looking for financial independence. Because when we think millionaire or millions, it seems way far off and unachievable. But how about you know, some methods to get you three to five thousand dollars a month coming in that you know you can count on that makes all the difference in the world. It's also a huge confidence and self esteem builder. So anyway, I go on four more years now. Keep in mind, I start feeding my mind. I'm buying every book I could get my hands on with you know marketing, sales, uh, how to communicate, uh, you know, business. And four years later, at the age of twenty seven, I hit a net worth of a million dollars. And uh, man, that was the home run for me. Now, it wasn't all cash. Some of it was equity. But I, I was written up in several national publications as one of the youngest self-made millionaires in the United States. And I decided at that point to, to write a book on how I did it. Now, this is going back 1984. Okay, so and you might not even been born then, were you, Andrew? Nope. Parents hadn't met yet. <laughs> I, I have underwear older than you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So um, I decided to write a book. Now, I'll say this. This is important here because we're going to get to the failure pieces, which I think will teach your audience a whole lot more than everything I can talk about success. Because along this way, there was lots of ups and downs, lots of failures, which is all part of the process. And that confuses and scares lots of people. But there's really nothing to be afraid of, uh, as we'll talk about as we get on into the interview. But anyhow... I decided to write this book, not because I thought I was a great author, but I had bought lots of books on making money and all this stuff. And then I'd go out and try them and it wouldn't work. So I always thought, luckily for me, I didn't have a lot of education. I was ignorant. 
So instead of learning all the reasons why things wouldn't work, I just went to work. I'd go over it, under it, around it, and try to figure it out, and always eventually did. So anyway, uh, I write this book, and then I start sending it off to a lot of publishers, and it gets turned down, turned down, turned down, turned down, turned down. And by the way, my, my motivation for writing the book was to tell the truth about how I really did it, deal for deal, and how, what strategies or what principles I used. The other reason I did it was this. My kids were now five years old and three years old. I had two kids now by the time I was 27. And their dad didn't graduate high school. Their dad got in trouble with the law. You know, their dad was kind of a screw up in his, you know, younger years. And if something happened to me, I, I didn't want that to be all my kids knew. I figured if I wrote this book, if something happened to me, my kids would be able to pull this book off a shelf and see that their dad wrote a book. And that was my motivation. So it was never about the money for me, to be honest with you. Uh, by the way, even getting involved in real estate, you know, at 20, it was never about, well, it was about the money, but yes, it was and it wasn't. People think that I made a lot of money in real estate because I was passionate about real estate. I was never passionate about it. I didn't know anything about real estate. How could I be passionate about it? I was passionate about being a millionaire. Because when I read that first Get Rich book, it said, if I followed the steps in that book, that I could become a millionaire. And that's what I latched on to, Andrew. I latched on to that because I didn't realize that then in hindsight, of course, it's easy to look backwards. I wanted to be a millionaire to show all those people that said that I was nobody and nothing and a loser and never good enough that I was somebody. And, and I thought becoming a millionaire would do that. Now, of course, we know, well, at least for me, Today, I realize that money really doesn't change people. It makes them more what they are. You know, so if one is, a, one is a jerk to begin with, money will give you the ability to be a bigger jerk. But if uh, you have some decency and morality about you to begin with, money gives you the ability to do that too. And I'd like to elaborate that on that as we get into the interview because that's a big piece to the inner voice. So, okay, so now I finally get a publisher to publish the book. Uh, it's a company called National Institute of Financial Planning. The contingency was if they published my book, I had to come out and speak at the, their conferences. And they had these big national conferences all over the country. And so I agreed to do that. Now, I'd never spoke and never even dreamed about uh, speaking. I was, a, I was a real estate guy. And so, but I, I, I did it because they were going to publish the book. And when I got out to this conference, I mean, it was all these big names out there. And... Um, I did my talk and there was this great adoration and people loved it. They could see the reality of it. And, you know, secretly, I think what God was doing was building my self-confidence and my self-esteem back. If you look back at my real estate business, my, what I specialized in was providing decent, safe and affordable housing for low-income people. So I got into it for the money, but really I focused on a group that needed hope, needed respect dignity. And I gave them that. Mine were always the best maintained properties, even though they were in tough neighborhoods. When I got into the speaking business, although it made a lot of money too, it was really all about sharing everything I had learned about how I made money and the strategies that I use with others. And same with Inner Voice. And we'll learn about why in a moment, because that's what Inner Voice is all about. It's all about finding one's purpose. So if anybody listening to you this uh, right now, is there an anxiety, anger, frustration, fear, doubt, any guilt or shame from the past, uh, I think I got a formula that can totally eradicate that. And although Inner Voice is a book that is not a, it's not a religious book, it doesn't conflict with any religion. Although it's not a book about making money, it's everything about making money. Now, I know we're kind of into this interview uh, a little deep right now, so I'll, let me mention this. If somebody has to get off this interview, I hate to leave you hanging. So if, if you have an interest in the Inner Voice book, you can simply go to the internet and look it up and you'll see five-star reviews from all over the world how, how this book is changing people's lives in a dramatic way. But today I'd like to give you the book free. I don't even want you to buy it. I'd like you to give you a free book. So if you simply go to men the, into your computer, type in the word men.innervoicesswag, S-W-A-G.com. So men.innervoicesswag.com. Uh, all you do is pay the shipping and handling, $6.97, and I'm going to ship you a hardcover collector's edition of the book. So it's not going to be a digital copy. You're going to get the real McCoy. These sell on Amazon for 20 bucks and more, so, so you got a real value here. There's no catch, no gimmick. But if you order that through, through right now through the uh, interview with Andrew, you go men.intervoicesswag.com. You're going to also get eight free videos I'm going to send you. These are 35 to 50 minutes long. We sell them for over $500, and this takes the inner voice message a thousand feet deeper. We're going to send them to you for free. 
We're also going to let you enroll in our VIP Mastermind Book Club absolutely free. It's a free webinar that I do where I'll take an hour and go through inner voice principles along with business principles and then take a half an hour Q&A. We're going to let you get into that for free. And then once you're done reading the book, you also get two free coachings with one of our inner voice certified business and transformation coaches. Those are usually $500 each. That's $1,000. So we're going to give you $1,788 in free, rich content value simply for ordering the book today and paying shipping and handling. I know that that sounds too good to be true, but this book is really causing a big vibration and we want to get the word out. And I, I think once you get it, if I have to motivate you by giving you some, you know, some bonuses, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, if you like what you read, you can help us by simply passing the word on. Yeah. And what's the domain again? Oh, it's, um, I'm sorry, it's men, no www, just put men.innervoicesswag, S-W-A-G, innervoicesswag.com, men.innervoicesswag.com. All right, and thanks for that, and I really appreciate that, spending the time to put all that together for my community, but go ahead and continue on with your story. I really want to get the lessons out of out, out of your journey. Okay, so uh, I, I go out and I speak at these conferences, and then I started my own seminar business. This is probably around 1985 or six, because I really loved sharing this information. I loved seeing people's lives transformed by learning these strategies. And these all people who wanted to reach financial independence were tired of their jobs, want to make more money, want to be secure and safe. And so I built a big company, but it was up and down and up and down, Andrew, from 1984 to 1992. Like every business I've ever been in, I, I've owned 30 businesses plus. Uh, every time I start a business, buy a business, usually about I get into it about two, two and a half years. And this is the process and how it'll work for everybody. Two and a half years later, I say to myself, gosh darn it, Russ, if you've ever known how much work this was going to be, I'd have probably never done it. But now we're into this thing two years, two and a half years. I've told everybody how great it's going to do. And now I'm in it up to my eyeballs. And so now i got to see it through. And usually year three, year four, doesn't mean it won't cash flow along the way. It, it, it usually will. But usually the average floodgates open at about three, four years into it. And that's just part of the process because if it was simple and just easy, everybody would be doing it. <laughs> so um, I then get out of the seminar business in 1992. I open up another chain of stores. Uh, these were recreational rental franchise stores. And they just didn't work. Two, three years later, failed. And, that, and that's because it wasn't aligned with my purpose, which we'll get to. So I got back into the financial training industry in 1996. I started a company called Whitney Education Group. And what we changed was we decided to design our programs after conventional education, like junior college and college programs. So these were 18-month to three-year continuity programs. The first year, 96, we did $5 million in business. The second year, $13 million. The third year, $26 million. The fourth year, 60 million to 90 million, 120, all the way up into 2004. By then, we were doing about 200, 250 million. Uh, I went from 12 employees to 2,000 employees in seven countries. Had a construction company that was building 500 homes a year that did $750 million. And from 2000 to 2006, now, of course, you got this radio show, show and viewership is a big deal. Think about this. From 2000 to 2006, I had over 60,000 people a month registering for our live training events in seven countries. We were doing some six to 700 live events a week all over the world. Yeah, so the company went nuts. I took it public, uh, went from 14 cents the stock uh, to $14. I had 5.5 million shares of stock, so you do the math, probably 60, 80 million worth of stock. Uh, the company was cash flowing a million a week after all expenses. So I had private jet, Citation 7 jet, Rolls Royce, Ferrari, you name it, any, anything you could think of. And then I came under an investigation by the SEC and the Department of Justice. And this is where the real story begins. So for everything I've already told you about, that was the connecting dot piece. Here's where the real, here's where the real McCoy starts. So the SEC and the Department of Justice investigate me for there's marketing efficacy. Now, when you're a public company, you don't have to do anything wrong to come under an investigation like that. Just like if you're audited by, by the IRS, doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Uh, and this investigation was heinous. It went on for four years. There was news, you know, headlines everywhere. So the stock dropped. I spent $22 million in legal fees over the next four years defending it. 
And at the end of that four years, there was no finding of any wrongdoing, no slap on the wrist, no fine, no sanction, nothing. But a thousand people lost their jobs. The company started to tube, the stock dipped. And now I'm in Florida, so, so you're now 2006, seven. The real estate market drops 80 to 90% here. And I was invested big in real estate. Overnight almost, it seems, 80% of my net worth was lost. Everything I'd worked for my whole life. My marriage started to crumble and ended up in divorce after 29 years. So I was getting hit from every side. So folks, anybody out there listening, if you're going through financial crisis or you got caught up in that real estate downturn, I can tell you here it in a voice, we, we hear that from people all the time that they're hitting 15, 60 years old and they don't have savings or they've, they've, they've lost everything in a financial crisis or, or they've got laid off their job. And, and right now they're like, what do I do? What do I do? Well, there's answers for what you do, both spiritually and economically. And, and I'm going to help you with that with my journey. So here's what happened. I, I walked away from my business. I was ousted from my company, just like Steve Jobs was booted out of Apple Computer years ago. I was booted out as CEO and chairman. Uh, lost 80% of my net worth, knocked down to my knees. And I just looked up, Andrew, and I said, God, what's the point? What, what am I here for? Everything I put my heart and blood into is gone, just boom, like that. And I, I started to think that of my life as... Most people do. I'll articulate it. Felt like a hamster on a hamster wheel. You know, you ever see that hamster in a pet store? He runs on this wheel, he runs on this wheel. And I don't care if you make five million a year or 50,000, it's the same hamster wheel. You go to work, get a job, find the significant other, uh, buy a car, buy a house, take the kids to soccer, have some financial crisis along the way, and recover from that. Every once in a while, have a, a good family or vacation day, say life is good, and then Monday morning back on the hamster wheel. And then 60 years later, we die. My feeling was, if that's all there was to this earth or this universe, and there's a God, then it would have to be a really mean one. And I didn't believe that was the case. I believed that I was missing some information. And so I went on a mission. Forget, forget about business and wealth and millionaire. I wanted to find out what's life about. What is this lifetime about? What is, what is earth about? And I went on a 20-country tour. So I walked away from all my businesses sacrificed millions and millions of dollars. And I visited Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Israel, Haiti, Colombia, Spain, all through Europe, South America. And I got to work with some of the top spiritual leaders, religious leaders, and business leaders worldwide. And I wanted the answer to two questions. What's the purpose of life? And who's right? Are the Christians right? Are the Jews right? Are the Muslims right? Are the Hindus right? Are the Buddhists right? Dr. Phil right? I don't know. Is Andrew right? Who's right? Probably Andrew, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, on this show, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least on this show. <laughs> well, I found some amazing answers, and, and I'm going to tell you this, that I didn't set out to write a book. I, I set out really to save my, my own life and figure it out. And, and now it ended up in, in a book, and that's a story for another day. Uh, but this was released just months ago, and I'm telling you, five, five star reviews from all over the world. It's hitting a nerve everywhere. And people are seeing it as not just some rhetoric. But holy crap, this, this is a, some information nobody's ever shared with me before anywhere. So in this book, well, here's what I learned, Andrew. In this book, in a voice, I talk in two voices. I talk in the voice of a warrior, and I talk in the voice of a statesperson. Now, the warrior years are generally 20 to 40 years old. And that's when we're all about us. We're all about how to fill my pockets. We're about the me, 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 and the I, I, I. And we operate most on just human, human training, what mom, dad, brother, sister, preacher, teacher, peers have put in our brain. Unfortunately, that training usually revolves around selfishness, self-centeredness, arrogance, finger-pointing, judging, blaming, criticizing, we sprinkle a little self-pity and victim into, into that. And we chase a lot of rabbits that we don't catch. You know, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, we quit at this, or we feel like a victim at that. And that's because we're running on total self-will, human, human training. Well, here's what I, I found as I travel worldwide. At the top levels of almost every religion and spiritual belief, there are some absolute commonalities. And one of them is this. Somewhere along the line, if we don't, don't get the message I'm about to give you, that the inner voice gives you, the universe will put you through a life crushing, just like I went through. Either life will crush you, you know, in, in tragedy, health, or otherwise. A relationship will crush you, you, significant other, child, family member. Or, here's the most common, we will crush ourselves in self-sabotage. 
And this is where we get knocked right down into the knees. We've just had enough of being beaten down. And we look up and say, say, what's the point? And usually that happens at about 40. That happens somewhere between 40 and 60 years old and above. We enter the statesperson phase of life. That's where we start to recognize mortality, that this journey is going to end. Is there a song we have inside that we haven't sung yet? Have we, have we lived our purpose out here? What was the point of it all? And this is where we start to go on our search for the truth. That's what the game of life is. The game of life is a search for the truth. And it's a search for the truth with you and the God of your understanding or the power of the universe, whatever you'd like to call it. It's the power that makes the sun go up and down every day and the tide go in and out every day. It's the one that guarantees if you plant a pumpkin seed, you'll never get a thorn bush, you'll get a pumpkin. That power. And it's a delicate balance. And this is where we start to learn the power of humility. Truly, the power. How does that work in our lives to give us great power? Tolerance, patience, kindness, letting go of resentments and forgiveness. And I, I got to tell you, if somebody gave me this talk 10 or 15 years ago, I'd have probably thrown them out of my office, Andrew. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have been ready to hear it. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I think many of us would be in that similar situation. You know, if you're not ready to consume material when it's being given to you, you know, you don't want it. You don't want anything to do with it. And so you've talked about statesmen and, and the warrior phase. What else is there? You know, there has, there should, there's probably more, right? Like what, what other phases are there to life? Yes. The four phases are athlete, warrior, statesperson, and spiritual. These were coined by the controversial Carl Jung or Jung. Everybody, some pronounce it different. I get corrected on it all the time. But anyway, and we subscribe to that. So the, you know, the athlete is in the school ages when we're just kids looking at ourselves and we don't, don't have a care or worry about careers and all that. It's all about us. Warrior years is when we enter into the competitive stage. Now we want to find our career. We want to win it. You know, we're in it to win it. We chase a lot of rabbits that we don't catch uh, because we're operating on self-will and we don't understand the immutable laws of the universe, that there is actually a playbook to the universe, which we'll talk about. And I, I elaborate on a lot in inner voice. Then there is the states person phase. That's where we start to learn the value of serving others, putting the other first, knowing that that's, that's how we really win. And the spirit phase would be more like Gandhi, Mother Teresa. I don't know that everybody, any, everybody doesn't get to that phase, but surely everybody enters into the other three. Now, usually that states person happens at about, you know, 40. Now, some people get it at 35, 30. Some never get it. So understand that too. If you were to be aware of this right now and have the ability to order the inner voice book, I think it puts you way ahead of the curve. You know, they say that a, a wise man learns from the mistake the, from their own mistakes, but a genius learns from the mistake of others. So what I'm telling you is you don't have to go do that. I already did it for you. <laughs> uh, so, And I don't recommend it, by the way. But anyway, at, at 40, this is where we enter into that, that place of experiencing mortality. The, the journey's going to end. Life's going to be over. Uh, did we sing the song what we're supposed to sing? Did we fulfill our purpose? What was the point of it all? And this is where, just to reiterate, we get the we, we start to learn the power of tolerance, the power of patience, kindness, letting go of resentments, forgiveness, and not just how to define them. Because usually, when we ask people about those types of things, humility, tolerance, patience, they set about defining. How do you do that? How do you do those things and turn those into an extreme power? And again, I say anybody right now listening who's in any kind of anger, anxiety, frustration, fear, doubt guilt, shame, financial issues, relationship issues. Listen, I, I don't care if it's anything from the, the housekeeper on up to the guy who manages an $800 million Morgan Stanley fund. We at Inner Voice work with all of them. We coach one of the sharks on Shark Tank, celebrity names that you would recognize. But 85% you know, of the worldwide population isn't in that category. So that's really where the focus is. Huh. And Russ, you have something called the immutable laws of the universe. Can you explain more about what these are? Immutable means irreversible, can't change it, must be, has to happen. So, Andrew, this is a good question for you. Let's, let's say this. If I plant a pumpkin seed, Mother Nature will never play a trick on me and give a thorn bush. But if I plant a pumpkin seed, I might not get a pumpkin. If I don't plant the seed deep enough or I plant it too shallow or I don't water it enough or fertilize it, I may not get a pumpkin. Would you agree with that? Yeah, right. 
Okay. Now, let's say, well, first of all, that struggle that I just talked about is an immutable law also because that's going to force us to go find out how deep to plant the seed or shallow to plant the seed. So it's an exercise in, in exercising our spiritual and our intellectual muscles. Now, let's just assume you and I then both plant the seed at the right depth. We water it enough. Is it possible that I will get the pumpkin and you don't? Yeah, it is. We should both get the pumpkin. So that's an immutable law. That's something that people just bypass every day. They don't get or how to apply it or have not gone on the search for the truth to understand how to use it as a power in their lives. So let me just give you uh, another example. It, I doubt anybody listening to me right now, now ever goes outside and wonders whether or not the sun is going to come up the next day or whether the tide's just going to go out and not come in. Those are all immutable laws of the universe, and it's a very, very delicate balance. So what we want to do is we want to learn how do those immutable laws of the universe apply to me and to my life? How do they apply to, basically, how do they apply to me and my life? Well, what inner voice is, is basically a playbook for life. In other words, let's assume you have a basketball player or a guy who wants to play basketball. He's in the greatest shape ever, but he doesn't know the rules. He could be playing against someone of much in less physical shape, but he's going to lose because he's going to double dribble or he's going to foul or what have you. Well, the same is true as life. Many people right now that are in anxiety, frustration, fear, or doubt, the reason they are there is, again, violating the immutable law of the universe. At the highest levels of religious and spiritual belief, all agree that God did not build human beings with enough energy for tomorrow, next week, or next year. And... When we start living in tomorrow, next week, next year, here's what we get. That anxiety, frustration, fear, and doubt comes from playing the what-if game. What if this? What if that? What if this work? What if that doesn't work? Well, we're not promised tomorrow. So we bring it back into today. Today, we're on this radio show. People listening are probably in a car or a home or on a computer somewhere. They got a place to sleep. There's nothing to be in anxiety, fear, you know, or frustrated about. God gives us lots of clues in nature, too, which inner voice ties. Uh, for example, what I just explained is why we never see two birds on an electric wire having a nervous breakdown. So it sounds like you're talking about living in the now and being <laughs> present. Yeah, because I, I know we spend a lot of time just dwelling about the past or looking forward to the future as if it's going to be so much better. Yeah. But what you're suggesting is really right now is the best moment. Yeah. And, and I agree with that. Well, these are the things that inner voice lays out. For example, how many people stop and say, okay, what, what is the game of life? What is it? What's the time clock and what's the scoreboard? How do I know if I'm winning or losing at the game of life? In one of the chapters, the time clock of life lays it out clearly the, that life is a search for the truth. That's what the game is, a, a daily search for the truth with us and the God of our understanding. Well, how do we do that? Well, in the Inner Voice book, there is a chapter called Two-Way Conscious Contact. This process was practiced by Harvey Firestone, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, some of the wealthiest men in the early 1900s, and women, for that matter, practiced this process. And this is a sure way to get divine guidance. How do I know whether there's a God or not? I can tell you, I went to church for years, and I never felt there was a working God, and I believed in God. But I never, here's how I looked at it. You know, I, I would have a success. I work my butt off. I fail. I make mistakes. And then I'd have a success and I'd be looking. I'd say, God, man, oh, man, I, I don't thank you, but I don't know wh what part you played. It feels like I did most of the work. Maybe on the next deal, you, you help out a little more. <laughs> and I don't mean that disrespectfully. It's just that's how it was for me. And I think that's how it is for lots of people. Well, the process of two-way conscious contact starts with what I'm grateful for. And it's a written process. It takes about five minutes. Then it goes to, hey, God, help me with this, that, the other, whatever I want, which she usually doesn't pay attention to. The critical part is, God, direct me in my thinking today. Show me your will, capital your will for me, and give me the power to carry that out. Now, what most people don't realize is that the average person gets sixty to 70,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of thoughts. And if we don't delineate, we can let the human behavior take over. That selfish, self-centered, finger-pointing, judging, blames, all the waste of time. We put, if we take and put those thoughts through the test we teach you in the Inner Voice book, which is called The Four Absolutes. If you put it through The Four Absolutes, you know, know it's divine direction. And that's simply this. The Four Absolutes are, is the message honest? Is it unselfish? Is it pure? And is it loving? If it's honest, unselfish, pure, and loving, you know it's divine guidance. 
have anything to do with the character defects that I just talked about, then you know that's just human baloney, and the best thing to do is throw that out. Well, I'm telling you, some of the wealthiest people in the in the early 1900s practiced this daily, and the only reason that information went away and that group went away is, is it got political and ended up disbanding. <laughs> it started out as pure and it ended up disbanding. So let's go back to the game of the, the game of life. The game of life is a search for the truth. That two-way conscious contact is a daily way to handle the search for the truth. The answers you'll get in that are amazing. The time clock for life is today. You know, just like in basketball, it's an hour. Uh, well, in life, it's today. We got to keep it in the moment. Now, as I told you, if you have anxiety, frustration, fear, and doubts, because you're living in tomorrow. Now, if we don't have enough energy for tomorrow, at the highest levels of spiritual and religious belief, they all concur that God didn't build us with energy for yesterday either. Normally, when we go to yesterday, we go to the guilt, shame, and resentment. I could have, I should have, why did not? That's done. It's over. That's just a, a total waste of, of mental energy, and it blocks. So, so life is a search for the truth. Keeping it in today is the key. What's the scoreboard? How do I know whether I'm winning or losing? Well, for me, it used to be this next merger, next acquisition, buy a car, get a jet, bigger house. What it, most people keep it in those terms. Today, by practicing the inner voice principles, because there's a whole action program here. It's not, it's not spiritual rhetoric. It's how do we change behaviors. The scoreboard for me at the end of the day when, to know whether I'm winning or losing at the game of life is what is my ratio of being happy, joyful, and spiritually free with the absence of anger, anxiety, frustration, fear, doubt, guilt, and shame? If I could put some days together where I'm ending, I'm happy, joyful, spiritually free. I'm not in any kind of anxiety, worrying about tomorrow, yesterday. That's a winning game of life. Things, things start to fall into place instead of people thinking they have to scratch and claw for it all. That's the problem is all those blocks and limiting beliefs they're all coming from mom, dad, brother, sister, preacher, teacher, have nothing to do with how life really works. So, Russ, do you find that when a man finds his purpose, that all of these things just start to come together? And, and a lot of these little things just don't matter as much anymore. There's no question in my mind about it. I was, I was, I was counseling a guy yesterday, coaching a guy, 67 years old, nice fella. He was in the food industry as a COO for years, making two hundred fifty or 60000 a year. Two year, years ago, he suddenly lost his job. He had a downturn in real estate and a lawsuit that he had to spend most of his $600,000 in savings that he was saving for retirement. Now no job is eating it away. He's at a place where he's literally uh, worried about it week to week. And he's like, Russ, I never thought I would ever be in this place. And I can tell you most of the people that are inner voice demographic in the 45 to 60 uh, year old range, a lot of them have been hurt financially, didn't plan correctly, spent too much, and, and are in that same situation. So let me get to the point. This is all part of the immutable laws of the universe. This is crisis. So listen closely to this, everybody. This is really, really important if you're struggling. Crisis is an immutable law of the universe. So think about this. Right now, everybody listening, everybody, and, and Andrew, tell me if you think this might not be true. Everybody who's listening to me right now is either in the middle of a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or what? Or you're about to go into a crisis. Is that not how life has been? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd say it's right. For the most part, that's right. Okay, and so here's why crisis comes. Again, God doesn't float around the sky, look like Moses and take score. There are immutable laws that govern life. We do have dominion if we learn the rules, and we learn those with the inner voice book, to start with anyway. So here's why crisis comes. If you have crisis in your life, it comes for one or all four of these reasons. You either have a behavior you need to change, a vice you need to give up, a character defect that you need to fix, or you're not stepping up to the potential that you were put on this earth to step up to. Violate any one or all, all of those for any length of time, crisis will surely come. Now, here's how we control crisis. The only thing that makes that crisis bigger or smaller is the resistance you give to it. Give that crisis resistance, it will get bigger and bigger and bigger till it crushes you. Yield to the crisis. Make the change. The crisis will diminish and then the next gift comes. Well, the, the playbook for life is this. Get used to it. The gift of life is in the struggle. 
if we didn't have struggles, we'd have no reason to be more patient, more tolerant, more kind. We'd have no reason to be better people today than we were yesterday. We definitely have no reason for God. Struggles are the gifts. We're judged on how well we handle that struggle. Handle the struggle correctly, the next gift comes, and then boom, here comes the next struggle. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the case, doesn't it? Well, Russ, can you give us an example of what this looks like? Now, I'll give you a good example. There's this nice little man walking through the forest, and he sees this cocoon falls out of a tree, you know, caterpillars in it. And you can see the caterpillars are kind of pushing against this little cocoon. And so the nice man takes his pocket knife out, and he just gently cuts that open, and he frees them, and boom, out fly 30 beautiful butterflies. And they go about 20 feet, and they, all 30 of them die. Well, why did they die? The reason they died is because they need their struggle inside that cocoon to build their muscles to survive out in the world. By the man cutting them out, he took their struggle from them. Huh. And I know in Chinese, the word crisis actually means danger plus opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. No question about it. There's no question. So these things that people fear, why is it always me? I'm in crisis. Why this? Why that? The best way I can say it is it's just like golf. The reason that most people stink at golf and the average golf score in the United States is 103 and every golfer is called the weekend hacker is because everything you do in golf is the opposite of human nature. If you want the ball to go up, you've got to hit down and trust the loft of the club. If you want to hit a good steady shot down the middle of the ferry, you have to swing easy and with a kind tempo, not rip it like a baseball. <laughs> so everything in, uh, in golf is the exact opposite. Well, so is spirituality. And the problem, whether good, bad, or indifferent, is this, and that is all of our behaviors have been taught to us by humans. That has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with God at all. So let's go back to your question because we kind of took a roundabout way here, and I didn't answer the one question. So remember, this is the caveat. I'm kind of like a cross-eyed discus thrower. I'm not very accurate, but I get the job done. <laughs> it's okay. The content's good, so I'm letting it flow. But we were talking about purpose and what happens when a man finds his purpose. Well, here's where purpose comes from. So I'm going to throw another curveball here. Purpose usually comes from childhood wounds and childhood experiences. Most people spend their adulthood trying to bury that childhood. I don't want to dig that stuff up. Oh, that happened in the past. I don't want to go back and relive that. But the problem is then they've never dealt with it. God created adulthood to heal childhood wounds to mature the soul. The three big reasons we're here on this earth, remember the hamster wheel story. What do you think you're here for? Just to struggle and work and run? No, there's a big point. Make the world a better place. Help people is the way we got to do that. That's what we learn in the states person. But the big one is mature the soul. So that when we die and this body decays, the soul gets that much closer to the universe. You know, I don't want to go into the depth of that piece right now, but I'll give, I'll give you the short version. Most people think that the body has a soul. And when the body decays, the soul goes off to heaven somewhere. Well, that's, that's absurd. It's like Sunday school talk, Disney talk. The body, from what I've learned, does not have a soul. I do definitely believe that the soul has a body, though, because if the soul goes somewhere when we die, where did it come from? And that's a big piece to understanding why life works the way it does. So now the short version is the soul attaches to the body at conception. When your mom and dad conceived you, the soul attached to the body at conception based on lessons it has to learn either in this lifetime or it hasn't learned in past lifetimes. And so when I tell my first spiritual coach that I had a you know, mom and dad that were abusive and they were bad to me and I didn't graduate high school, he, she stopped me gently and said, well, Russ, you can't claim that. And I said, what do you mean I can't claim that? He said, you can't, can't claim all that talk about your mom and dad because you picked them. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty heavy duty. Well, let's, let's go back to the point. It's very possible that I was the abusive alcoholic mom or dad in a previous lifetime. Now I become the child of, to learn what that feels like. I can tell you when I went through my discovery chart process in Inner Voice, what I realized was this, that my purpose in life, when I look back and I connect the dots, and if you're listening, there's a great uh, YouTube video. It's the Steve Jobs Stanford University commencement speech. who talks about connecting the dots backwards in life. Uh, be a really good one for you to listen to because he and I are talking about the same exact thing right now. But uh, when I went through, back through and I looked at the businesses that worked for me, 
my real estate business was providing decent, safe, and affordable housing for low-income people. The seminar business was helping people out of financial crisis and, and teaching them how to build financial independence. The inner voice is all about maturing the soul and getting right spiritually and financially. But when I went back and connected my dots, it became very clear to me that I have a very selfish need, and I say selfish because spirituality is selfish. We never do humility, tolerance, patience, and kindness for the other guy. We do it to save our own lives. To think we do it for someone else would be the epitome of arrogance. So again, that's like the golf shot, completely apart from what we've ever learned. But I have a very selfish need to help and save people because nobody was ever there to help and save me as that abused child of alcoholic parents. Now what I have to do is find an economic generator that's in line with my purpose. No matter, matter how we cut the cake, this is a capitalistic country in a capitalistic world. I didn't create that. You know, maybe that's God. I don't know. I just know we all have to earn a living. I, I also know that every business that I've been into where I've been able to align that with my purpose has flourished. The ones that were not in line with my purpose were up and down, up and down, and eventually failed. So today, it's real clear for me. So when you hear these guys in these motivational seminars after they have you walk on the coals or climb the ropes, they say, find something you're passionate about, and, you, and you'll be really good at it. it. It never happens that way. Purpose always comes first. And then we build a passion as we start to master that economic generator. Yeah, you make a good point there. And let's just break it down, make it real clear. What's the process for finding your life's purpose? What can someone do to get that? Yeah, there's a process in the book. It's, it's called the discovery chart. There, there's a whole chapter with the actual charts in there as well. And what we, what we show them how to do is how to go back into the childhood, identify the fears, angers, and resentments that they have. And then we get to see clearly what was done to them because that's what shaped their behaviors. Then on the other side of the chart, it shows their behavior. Why do you act the way you do? Why do you have the limiting beliefs you do? Why do you have fear and doubt? Why do you not have confidence in yourself? Why do you not trust the process? And this is all based on what was done to you. Then what we find out is, is we go to what we call the harm chart part, uh, and we start to realize that, holy crap, in our adulthood, we're doing to other people exactly what we hated was done to us. And when we look at that, that's usually the catalyst for the change to states person. I don't want to be this anymore. How do I climb out of this rut, this fear, this doubt, this anxiety, you know, this constant struggle? There's got to be a better way. How do I do it? This is the process. So should someone sacrifice their financial well-being for living their purpose or following their purpose? Should you f sacrifice financial well-being? Usually, I, I think that the purpose helps f find the burst in the financial gain. In other words, every business I've ever been in that has succeeded has been in line with my purpose. The ones that haven't, haven't. So if you're in a business right now and it's struggling, and it's up and down, up and down, or a job you hate, you're not in line with your purpose. Yeah, I, I think a lot of us can relate with that. And, and I myself was in that position and just, and just quit. <laughs> so now, Russ, we're getting late. We're kind of going past time here. So let's now enter the knowledge round. And so we're asking some rapid fire questions. So are you ready for the knowledge round? Yeah, let's go. Do you ever have so many books to read that you end up not reading at all? You have so many books in your library on your list of books that you want to read, but you don't know which books to tackle first. I know in all of my episodes, I ask guests, what are your favorite books? What are your most influential books? And they always list three or four. And I always ask guests for their favorite success quote. I find that quotes can be so powerful sometimes, yet there's so many available. So what I've done is I put together a list of the top 30 books and top 30 success quotes that I think every man must live by. And these are directly from guests on the Knowledge for Men podcast. And as you know, some of the guests on my show sold their companies for millions of dollars, they're running billion dollar organizations, they're dating coaches, they're health coaches, they're entrepreneurs, they're celebrities on TV, they're mixed martial artists, just this wide variety of great minds. And I put together a list of the top 30 books and top 30 success quotes that every man must live by. You can download this guide for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives. Starting in three, 
two, one, showtime. All right, Russ, what was holding you back from becoming the man you are now today? Uh, lack of knowledge and lack of wisdom on how the spiritual side of life worked. All right. And earlier, Russ, you mentioned after going through a crisis, you traveled the world and went to over 20 countries doing some soul searching. What were some of your biggest takeaways on that journey? Uh, one of the biggest takeaways is I've written 30 books, three bestsellers. I've had 6 million people go through my training events. I've been to every motivational seminar you can think of. And I had not heard the information that I learned on that trip anywhere in, in any place in my life. It absolutely changed my life to understand the immutable laws and the spiritual side of life and then put it into practice and see evidence that it's the only way. And what advice do you have for someone who is on their purpose? They're living their purpose, but they're failing at it. Mm. Stick and stay till you get your pay. I mean, I know that sounds simple, but if you're on purpose, listen, I, I, I was on inner voice for, I started on my, on my journey, March 8th, 2008. And I'll tell you what, about two years ago, it's around two years ago, I had no idea whether I was supposed to monetize it or if it would monetize because it's such a pure message. And I had a talk with God. My talk with God was saying, listen, God, if you don't want me to monetize this, fine. I still got to be in business. I'm good at it. I like it. It drives me. So bring me something along. Well, you know what? That next day, within a day or two, I had a call from a good friend of mine, Larry Benet, the founder of Sang. We started talking about my journey. He said, wow, send me your notes. Within two days, he called me back and said, I got to put you in touch with Reed Tracy over at Hay House. They're one of the largest spiritual publishers in the world. They do Deepak Chopra, Wayne Dyer, all the big ones. They'd love this. I, I say, you know, Larry, come on. I'm Russ Whitney, the financial guy. Who, they're not going to take me serious. I have no credibility there. But after talking to him, he said, well, send me your notes. I'll look at them. Now, these were not a manuscript. I mean, these were, you know, probably 100,000 words, which would be a 1,000-page book. And I sent him these notes within a couple of days. The CEO of one of the largest spiritual publishing outfits in, in the world calls me back. He said, we love this. We want to help you make a book out of this. So... When you're aligned with purpose, things are supposed to fall into place just like that. Next thing you know, there's a book. Next thing, there's an e-learning. There's DVDs. There's CDs. There's coaching programs. In every business that I've ever done, Andrew, I, there's always a business plan. There's been a plan, a budget, a forecast, da 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 This one fell into place as it's supposed to do when one is in line with their purpose. The right contacts will come along. The right people will come along. The money will show up. The right talent will show up. And that's exactly how Inner Voice has been built. I, I've done almost nothing to drive it. It's all fell into place. Yeah, that's beautiful to hear that story. It really is. And now, Russ, I have a scenario here for you. Imagine you had 60 seconds with your 20-year-old self. What would you tell him to do and what would you tell him not to do? <sighs> okay, here's what I would, I would go. I'm getting goosebumps right now. <laughs> what I, I would do is I'd tell him I'm going to give you a sound bite. It's, it's going to give you it's going to give you a sound bite with direction, but you have to take it on your own to take it deeper because I only have 60 seconds and it goes like this. God, give me the gift of peace to accept the things I can't change. Can't change yesterday who I was, bad behavior, good behavior, failures. My parents can't change that. Give me the gift of peace to accept that and wear it as a badge of honor, knowing it's nothing more than a connecting the dots of my life to find my true purpose. Give me the courage to change the things I can. Help me to be more patient, more tolerant, more kind, to listen more, to be forgiving and let go of resentments, knowing that holding on to resentments is the equivalent of me drinking poison and hoping the other guy dies. And last, the wisdom to know the difference. On this journey, what, what can I expect from you, God? And what should you expect from me? What you've taught me is my job is to get up every day, suit up, show up, bring my common sense, my intelligence, and my blessing to the game every day, but leave the results to you. Because the results are going to be what the results are going to be. And all I can do is all I can do. And all I can do is enough. Wow. Music to my ears, Russ. Now, what two or three life skills do you need in order to succeed in your field? First of all, you know, you, you need the charting process to find the purpose. That's, it's not something that just comes to most of us. 
it will happen by accident to most. I mean, mine, as I look back in hindsight, I told you what they were. They were all helping people businesses because that was in line with my childhood wounds and what I was put here to do. So I would say what if you ask me, what would one need? I, I'd say in the warrior years, you know, it's confidence. Don't quit. Also recognizing that success doesn't breed success. Failure breeds success. So don't be afraid to fail. And if in your heart of hearts, which I would call your inner voice, what you're doing is honest, unselfish, pure, and loving, stay, stay at it till you get the break. Huh. Yeah. And Russ, what's one underrated characteristic that you believe if everyone would work on this, they could see massive results in their life? Yeah. Working on the spiritual solution. Search for the truth with you and the God of your understanding. Listen to your inner voice and guide it by these four absolutes, honesty, unselfishness, pureness, and lovingness. All right. And Russ, when you were doing the 20 country tour around the world, you asked yourself this question earlier. You said, you know, what's the purpose of life? What did you find? How did you answer that? What I came to find is that, um, religions are mostly saying the same thing in different times, cultures, and languages. The, where, it gets, where it gets confusing is where man gets involved and throws his dogma in. If we take all man's dogma out, it'd be a simple message. And, huh. and now, Rush, just looking back at all the things you've accomplished, all the things you've done, uh, building you know, multiple companies, taking companies public, and philanthropy... Uh, best-selling author, mentor, coach. What would you say is your philosophy on life and success? What is my philosophy on life and success? Hmm. I'd say my philosophy on life is stick to the scoreboard every day, the scoreboard for being, being the success of your life. What is your ratio of being happy, joyful, and spiritually free at the end of each day? with the absence of anger, anxiety, frustration, fear, doubt, guilt, and shame. And if you want to know how to do that, uh, page 34 of the Inner Voice book gives you a clear explanation of understanding your powerlessness and how to surrender that to win. So that would be my take on life. Success is a sum total of all the minor things you do correctly. Let's let's take the seminar business. The final sale is nothing more than a sum total of all the minor yeses one gets. So the room has to be right. The lighting has to be right. The dress has to be right. The behavior has to be right. The hygiene has to be right. If we approach each day giving it the best we can, that's what I would say would be the best approach to success. Now, listen, there's, there's many of those. If it were in business, I'd say hire good people if you could afford it. Uh, train them and get out of their way and manage by the P&L. All right. Thank you for sharing. And Russ, you had some gifts for my audience. So go ahead and uh, tell my audience how they can get those. And I'm interested in what you're doing now since you've kind of taken this new new journey, this new path, uh, well, since your book has been launched. Mm. What's exciting me is I've written a lot of books and I've spoke to a lot of people. This book, when I wrote this book, every day that I sat down to write this book, I asked God to give me his words and not mine, to make this his message and not mine. Now, there, there's a good, a good way to approach it. Cause I, I kid around with people these days, and I tell them, you know what, every once in a while I have this talk, talk with God. I say, hey, listen, God, if this inner voice business doesn't work, you're going to look really bad because it has your name all over it. <laughs> all right. And so how's everything going with the book now? And Yeah, I, I think it's all the reviews, the five-star reviews, the letters we're getting now. We have a you know, great email campaign. We're building a community just like you are. So the people are starting to understand the lingo and they're putting the inner voice principles into place and they're getting the results. They're getting the evidence. And the beautiful thing about it is like when I would teach people real estate or business, it might take you three, four, five, or six months to see any results. With inner voice, anybody in anger, anxiety, frustration, fear, doubt, guilt, shame, confused, in, in an hour and a half hour session or a video that we send out, they get instant relief. Instant. So, I don't know, it's just a great feeling to see, see someone get relief. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to have a problem tomorrow or the next day. That's going to happen until we teach them enough of the principles to where they get reflexive. But I see the people get res relief and when they, they say, wow, this is stuff I've never heard before. You know, it, it, it's real. That that turns me on. It makes me crazy. Now, I, I still have real estate. Like, I'm building a 480-unit development in Costa Rica right now. 
But I don't get up a bit passionate about, about that. It's for money. I do it for money, you know, to, to maintain a lifestyle. But inner voice is what gets me out of bed in the morning. Ah, I love hearing that. I, I can hear the passion just in the tone of your voice. And what was the link? What was the URL so the audience can get the gifts that you wanted to offer my audience? Okay, so anybody listening, if you would like to get the Inner Voice book for free, uh, simply go to men.innervoiceswag.com. I know that's a mouthful. No www, just men.innervoiceswag.com. And all you do is go to that site and um, opt in there. You will you pay shipping and handling, $6.97. We will send you a free hardcover collector's edition of the Inner Voice book, shipped to you, mailed to you, so it's not a digital copy. You'll also get eight videos that, that we sell for over $500. You'll get eight videos free. They're 35 to 50 minutes each, and they're me taking the Inner Voice content a 1,000 feet deep, deeper. So, so if you liked what you heard on this show, you'll love the videos. Uh, You'll get access to our VIP Mastermind Book Club webinar. And this is me doing an hour webinar on business and inner voice with a QA. and a Also, two free coachings from one of our inner voice certified uh, business transformation coaches. And this would be on personal or business. If you're having trouble, relationship, anger, anxiety, frustration, fear, doubt, any of those human train or human taught trained emotions, you'll get two free coaches. So bottom line is we're going to give them $1,788 $1,788 worth of great content-rich bonuses for simply ordering the Inner Voice book and paying only shipping and handling of $6.97. No catch, no gimmicks. All right, Russ, thank you so much for those gifts and those bonuses uh, to my audience. And thank you for your time. You know, I know that we this is a longer episode here and you really just gave us a lot of good content and you shared your story and you're vulnerable. And, you know, I just, I really appreciate that. Superb. Well, thank you very much. And uh, hey, everybody listening, I just want to say uh, until we meet, good luck to all of you. God bless you on your journey. And I hope to meet you one day and feel free to uh, visit the Inner Voice community. All right. That's going to wrap up episode 102 with Russ Whitney. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast show. It's been a pleasure having you be a part of a thriving community of men who want to crush it in all aspects of life. I'm on a mission here to inspire millions of guys. And with your help, we're going to make a dent in the universe. Check out knowledgeformen.com for a ton of free content that's designed to help you live a remarkable life. Again, that's knowledgeformen.com. I hope to see you there. And always remember, 2014 is the official year of the crush, where we take action to get the life we've always dreamed of. This is your host, Andrew Farabee. And until next time, let's do it.